Good afternoon, Tony Abatini, Game On, coming live from WTBQ Radio in Warwick, New York. Today's topic, speed. Who wants more speed? Who wants to run faster? Speed, as we know, is probably the most coveted skill in all of sports, no matter what sport you play. Running speed, acceleration, redirection, it's the holy grail. It's what everyone wants. Three years ago, I can tell you that uh, Frozen Ropes as a company uh, d- decided to learn more about this concept and skill called speed. We launched our Turn and Burn program, which is our speed program, a few years ago with the help from one of the country's best speed coaches. I have to tell you, th- the name of his company, it's even cooler than the name of my company, Frozen Ropes. Whew. I'll say it again because... The name of Ed Lovelace, and we'll learn more about Ed and have a chance to, to listen to him for quite some time today. name of his company is Whew. Now, when you think about speed and sprint, what cooler name could you have? And Ed Lovelace, who is the owner and master fusioneer, as, the, has, as his company is, uh, is known as, um, probably one of the most renowned track and speed coaches in the country. He's worked with NBA stars Vince Coleman, Ray Allen. He's worked with NFL players, players in Major League Baseball, All-American at Arizona State University where he ran the 100 and 200 meter, qualified for the 1992 Olympic trials in the 200 meter. When you talk about speed in this country, it's Ed Gogo Lovelace. Ed, Tony Abatini from Game On in New York, welcome to the show. Tony A, what's up, man? Nice to, nice to be here. I'm what's doing... Up, everybody worldwide. I'm, I'm doing well, and, and Ed, uh, I... Talked a little bit about how you and I met. Uh, that some of the some of the times that we've had the privilege of having you up in Orange County and some of the joint events that we've done in, in New York City. Uh, it, it's all about speed and probably the most undervalued and and perhaps misunderstood concept in in building athletics. And we had soccer coaches on last week and baseball coaches on, and they all agree. Tim Walton from the University of Florida echoed the same sentiments. Boy, if you have speed, as in running speed, you can play so many different games. Am I, am I exaggerating when saying that it really is the magic bullet with so many of the athletes that you see at the amateur level, Ed? It is absolutely the magic bullet um, in, in a, a bunch of different ways. And I guess that's why we're here to kind of table the subject and really simplify and drill down to exactly why and uh, how those who uh, seek it can get it. Yep. Well, Ed, let, let, let's kind of get right to it. I mean, you, you see hundreds, uh, uh, probably thousands of young athletes run, um, and th- there's so many problems with the running, but I know you and I talked about, and, and, and you're famous for, hey, you need to learn how to walk properly before you learn how to run again. And I know so uh, a big part of your training program is really teaching young athletes how to walk differently. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Well, everybody goes into before before I drop why the walk is so important. Let me let me first start by saying, by and large, there's there's folks out there that know what they're doing um, to a degree, and I say it with respect. Uh, but many folks take these young athletes who have dreams and they dig right into starting going starting to go fast. They all want to go fast, 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 and ladders and all kinds of stuff. And the problem is. When they dive right into it that way, it's kind of like racing a Formula One race car that has a fixer flat in it. It's nothing good that's going to come out of that, and they're going to take a turn or go 200 miles an hour, and, you know, the rest is history regarding that fixer flat tire. So walking is what I like to start with. And, because, and let me first start by saying everything we talk about and discuss, it's all science. So I, I don't like to get in to, you know, showdowns with, you know, baseball of files and baseball gurus per se. Uh, I'm just a messenger of science, and I've learned, I've, I've tailored it for this discussion and for the sport of baseball. While I do other sports for today, it's baseball. So with that, you know, science says many things, and the two things we deal with is physics 
which is the law of the land, and physiology, which is the law of the body, period. The world identifies that and knows it for many, many years, eons, centuries. So there's a formula that goes with going forward. Forget about running fast. There's one formula. That formula is stride length times stride frequency equals speed. Boom. So with that, most people don't know how to walk right, and that formula applies to walking and jogging and running because it's two-leg being on planet Earth, gravity 9.8 meters per second. So there's this formula that I didn't come up with. You know, the great physicists of the world have it, and that formula yields speed. And since that formula applies with going forward, we deal with walking first because I can tell exactly what a person that seeks to go fast is doing wrong even before he starts running because well, Ed, the walking indicates it. Ed, it's, it's, it's interesting, and I actually saw you do this maybe a year ago. Remember when we were in Mon the Monterey Woodbury High School gym? You had yep. maybe 40 athletes that were there, and you asked them to walk. And about yep. 30 seconds later, w with the, uh, the baseball coach and, and, and myself there, uh, I remember you saying, okay, those are the two fastest players uh, in, in your program, just simply based upon how they walk down the gym. It was, it was incredible. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Because what happens is bells and whistles are applied with speed. And, and my goal here is to really, while it's a business and, you know, I, I do it, have done it, and run with all the fast people in the world, no one's, you know, speed is like this black science and dark magic, and, and people are being taken advantage of with an within out clause with many of those who don't really know it. So I'm really here. I hope I don't, you know, make folks mad that may be culpable of that, but I'm here as an advocate for kids and parents in a, in a, in a tough time in the United States where, you know, things cost a lot of money, and I'm, I'm trying to be a help to that. So, yeah. You can tell who's fast and who's not just by how they're walking based upon that formula. And I look at that individual and I go, wow, or great, now let's go to work based upon that formula. And you just simply look at movements that the body tells you and you go, okay, he's fast and he's not just by looking. And many other people from my world of world-level sprinting can do that. Um, and it's just like I, I, I never per, uh, purport to be the guy that knows how to swing a bat, work an inside, outside pitch or any of that. I just master what I master, which is the movements that dominate the world, which is, you know, running. And that's what we do. Ed, it's, so, inter yeah. it's interesting. And you mentioned because there are so many people out there, organizations, everyone is a speed and agility expert now. You go everywhere in the country whether it's soccer, baseball, basketball, you've got personal trainers, and, and everyone now is professing to be able to increase speed, first step quickness, agility. I know the first thing when, when you came in and, and looked at our training program, I think it was kiddingly, but we, we, we took it to heart. Tony, get rid of those cones and ladders and parachutes and, and all that toy stuff like everyone else is doing, and let's get down to the core of the thing. Explain that a little bit. I mean, certainly in, a ra in an hour radio show, we can't get into a exactly the, the magic formula uh, for your company. I know we'll, we'll have you back up here um, sometime soon. And, and Ed's company, Fusioneering.com, uh, if you go and just Google Ed Lovelace or P-H-E-W, you'll see all the places where Ed is offering programs and whatnot. But it was remarkable that everyone's teaching speed and quickness and I'll say it because you're trying to be diplomatic. Most people have no clue how to teach it. But let's go one step forward. Yeah, because who am I to say that? Who am I to say they don't know how to teach it? I, just, I like the facts, so it, it, I get out of the world of subjectivity. So then, I, you know, you're, you're convicted by your words, especially in this, the, the world of sports and in performance. You know, your words better back up performance or you're finished. So here it is. There may be some people that know how to teach speed. Okay, fine. The bottom line is speed is like finance, like money. It's very simple. Either it's the same, you lost it, or you gained it. That's it. <laughs> simple. So with that, if I'm trying to learn how to become a sharpshooter, I'm not going to go to a pastry chef. I'm going to go to uh, U.S. military trained, central intelligence agency trained individual that knows how to 
with that skill set. So I know that I'm cool in doing that. Many people that are teaching speed and agility have never run fast in their life. So they may know some things, but can you deliver it where you can run against the best in the world and not shudder and say you can do it? Because that's what people are looking for. They don't want, well, I don't know. How can you get me to run 6-3, coach? Well, I don't know. Usually there's an escape strategy. They say, well, you know, you can't teach speed. Boom, done. Well, Ed, it's interesting. You have to be able to articulate. Yeah, it's interesting because there are some that would say that you're either fast or you're not. That the the DNA and genetics that were inherited from mom or dad, that that's it. Um, we we've never believed that. I, I know you don't believe that, and you certainly can take a below average runner and 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 with some work and with some good information and hard work, because um, because I know we'll talk later on that, that simply um, you can have the best speed coach and get a good understanding of posture and arm mechanics and stride length and knee height and whatnot, but without supplementing that with strength training and simply then going out and doing the hard work, you're not going to get faster. And I I think most of the players that we see, that we've had an opportunity to share with them your system, they are getting faster, but it's a lot of hard work, and, and we certainly are not telling anyone that, well, you're just slow now and you'll always be slow. Mm-hmm. No, well, yeah, no. It, 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 it's, I, I like that because the system, what, let me first start by saying that what we do is not new. It's, it's over 80 years old and comes from the, the world of, of elite sprinting, world-level track and field, Olympic track and field. All right? Um, I learned from some of the best coaches in the world, Coach Norman Tate, um, Dr. Leroy Walker, John Smith, um, you know, some really, really, really standout people. So with that, that's where this comes from. I just kind of, you know, from the world of hip-hop and marketing and mass production and, you know, just knowing Generation X now, you have to deliver it cool and have to be quick, you know, kind of like in a bottle. So with that, therein lies the exit strategy I keep talking about because, you know, the, the, the Smiths and the Johnsons throughout the United States pay X individual to get little Johnny fast. And then, you know, little Johnny has gained some weight and he's gotten some muscles. And then when he comes to run the 60, we're talking baseball, little Johnny went from a 7.5 to a 7.4, 7.3. But that doesn't cut the mustard because you won't get a scholarship. And what happens is the individuals out here go to the exit strategy to the Johnsons and the Smiths of the U.S. and say, well, you know, you know, you can't teach speed. So that kind of prevents an assault right. <laughs> from a parent on an individual. And they go, well, you know, I guess you're right, man. You know, he gets it from his mama or he gets it from his daddy. He runs like he's got a piano on his back. Oh, thanks a lot. And the guy gets away or the individual gets away or the entity gets away. And there's a few of them. And that's the exit strategy. But so, that's not true. So we can certainly say that if someone wants to get faster, Ed, with hard work, with good information, that they, they certainly can in, in, improve. And I know we're talking baseball here and baseball, softball, but uh, certainly when, when you, your system works for all athletes, you've worked with lacrosse, college lacrosse teams at Cal State Fullerton, to the football, to the soccer. I, I think the one thing that we, we see over and over again um, and, and I want you to, before we go to the first break, if, if you can, um, yep. with all the athletes that you've seen, let's take a 12-year-old. It, it's, it's sometimes hard to generalize with some red flags in running, but the 12-year-olds that you see out there, 11, 12, 13-year-olds, we'll, we'll give you a three. The one major flaw in, in their running, jogging, or even walking mechanics that you can share with the audience that, that you see over and over again Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And I, I know um, I know you probably have fifteen of them, but give me the give me the one most common one that you see. The key indicator. I mean, there's there's quite a few and there's levels, but just the bare minimum. The good news is, and let me before I answer your question, there's one thing. It's not about soccer, baseball, football, lacrosse, basketball. That's the beauty of speed. It's about a number, and I like to lead with that answer: is one plus one is two forever around the world, Japanese, Chinese, Puerto Rican, Russian, that's what it is. So what goes on is speed is that based on a number, and the first piece I see, whether it's football, NBA, NFL, I see the heel strike. The heel strike is one of the indicators that lets me know, yeah, whatever. 
I love to see a guy that tells me he runs six seven with a heel strike. There's a bunch of other stuff, but I love that because if a guy tells me he's six seven, I know off the top I'm looking at six five, six four in a blink of an eye. Once you address the then, heel strike issue. Heel strike issue. Well, what happens the body is designed to go forward. You know, everybody has this misnomer, oh well you run distance, you strike your heel. Wrong. You're going forward. When your heel strikes the ground, that's a breaking action. Simple. So it's kind of like driving a, you know, you're in a dragster. Are you going to drag race with the brake on? No. The brake must be off. So the heel strike positions the body to go backwards, not forward. So it's counterproductive. You're trying to go forward. You're positioning the body's weight um, to be in a, a rear position thing, if you would. So no weight is falling forward or going forward. So it's counterproductive, which yields, uh, yields heel spurs, plantar fasciitis. Um, degeneration of the lower back, tight lumbar, so as, and you know, I can go on. Hey, we're, we're, so, talk, yeah. we're talking live with, with Ed Lovelace from Fusioneering.com. We'll continue to talk about running, sprinting, and the misconceptions and, and how you as a parent and amateur coach can get good information and make Johnny run faster or Jane. We're talking speed, the holy grail of all athletics. Joining us from New York City, Ed Lovelace, the doctor of speed, Gogo Ed. Ed, you've got more nicknames than uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, every nickname is apropos. It's all about speed. Uh, the name of Ed's company, Fusioneering.com, or P-H-E-W, or pronounced the cool way, Whew. Ed, we were talking about heel strike and some of the red flags that that that, that you see in, uh, in in the thousands of players that you see around the country, um, the world, around the world. Let, let, we're not even going to talk about the fixes on on heel strike. Um, how about this as a mindset? And and we we got this from you. Hey, if you want to run faster, you have to have the intention to run fast. And I think people sometimes forget about mindset. And that if you want to get fa- if you want to go faster from home to first, or if you're playing soccer and, and that that ball is 15 yards in front of you, neurologically and psychologically, or a combination thereof, you need to have the intention to want to run harder. I, I, is that in and of itself a way that some players can get faster just by having that requisite intent? Uh, I mean, hey, <laughs> uh, uh, let me let me let me answer facetiously. Uh, you could be on the edge of a building and jump and want to fly, but you can fly real hard. But if you don't know how, you won't. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so you can work hard all day long and remain slow. And that there is what I like to do is kind of fix people and so their, their dreams aren't just dashed. It's about working smart. Speed is about intelligence. And you simplify it so you just go forward. It's simple. One plus one is two. Three, how about this? 3.2 and 3.2 is a 6.4. There's a 60. It's just that simple. A lot of people uh, um, load it up with a bunch of big words and, and, and fancy science talk, which does apply. But, you know, that works for the world of track and field. In baseball, you want to get it, go, gone. You know, no one's trying to, you know, leave class either college or high school and go out to a baseball field and then take another physics class. You're just not trying to do it. You want to play baseball. So it's not about harder. It's smarter and simplification. Speed is very simple. It's one move. Think of it. It's universal. Speed is a universal thing. All things fast are one movement, a karate kick, a punch, um, a quarterback throwing a ball, a swinging of a bat, a pitcher when he follows through. That's one move. People teaching more than one move is not teaching speed. They're teaching sensor, sensory overload to get a check. So it's that you simple. Know? I mean, it's interesting, Ed. So if speed is one move, as our expert is telling us today, then it's the most simple yet complex riddle within athletics because the, the amount of information overload, you called it sensory overload, and, and put your hand here, put your foot here, put your knees here – how are all those moving parts, in, in your words, one move? Well, what happens is it's called synchronization, all right? That's why, like, you know, and here's the joke. Like, everybody who says you can't teach speed never ran fast. Ha, ha, ha. Great. And then the second thing is someone that says they're teaching speed and agility, and I can say this coming from a dominant position 
in the planet, having run against and with the fastest people on the planet, uh, that, you know, they say, well, you can't run fast, so hmm, have you ever run fast? Well, no, but I trained this and that one. Listen, we're not interested in who you trained. Have you run fast or have you made someone really run fast? And typically once you, you, you corner them, they go, no, not really. So speed and agility is redundant. That's like me saying I teach pitching and pitching, okay, which brings us to the other funny. Speed is one word. That's why I say we teach speed. We sell speed because in order to get to the top word speed, this is what builds to speed, rhythm, timing, balance, strength, flexibility, anaerobic, aerobic capacity, spatial awareness, you know, and the ability to listen. All of those elements make one word. You've never seen a cheetah, a clumsy cheetah, in your life, ever. So what you, everybody on this radio show has just learned speed, the automatic byproduct of speed is agility. If you're fast, you're automatically agile. The definition is being able speed uh, agility is the ability to move your weight at will in any direction. If you're fast, you can do that. Period. Now, Ed, if someone doesn't have the privilege uh, or the finances or geographically can't come and, and see you uh, in New York City or all the other places that you're in, you, you, let's take a hypothetical. You've got, a again, a 12-year-old boy at home in the backyard or whatnot. What, what are some very easy or even just general exercises that, that – a young parent or a young Little League coach can put forward and present to, to possibly start this, this speed component with his athletes? Any advice, any general advice? Um, I'll give you mine, but it's not about my advice because I'm one of your students. I, I want to hear from the teacher. All right. Well, uh, first we'll start by simplistic. If, uh, get to your local frozen ropes. Shameless <laughs> plug. <laughs> All right. But if you can't do that, um, and I'll answer that question. Uh, what I've done, uh, yeah, I'm from the fastest city in the world, and I realize everybody can't get there to get the speed info. So, you know, I'm going across, I'm going around the world to share it with infrastructure. So if you can't get at Appetine, Frozen Ropes, then we're doing it with the official system for Major League Baseball, um, Urban Youth Academies. And that is wired in, it's in L.A., it's in Houston, it's, in, it's going to be in Cincinnati, Philadelphia, Orlando, and New Orleans. So if you can't get it there, then I'm doing it in Texas. Um, we're, we're, we're basically going to run the state of Texas with Fusion Aaron. So if you can't get that, here's your general answer, man. You know, and here's the jewel. Get on the balls of your feet. There's no such thing as a flat foot speedster. And then you look at the model. The speed is based on the world record. Look at every world record holder. You will never, ever find him on the flat foot position. Balls of your feet is the key. And then the other thing is just pick your knees up, you know. Stride length comes stride frequency. You get stride length from lifting up your knee. You get on the balls of the feet, that puts you in the forward position. That whole you need a lean thing, is, is, it's, a, it's a joke. Stop teaching it, in fact. Coaches out there, if you're listening, I'm telling you, you won't run fast, you won't run fast bent over. You run tall. So... Get your knees up and get on the balls of your feet, and the body kind of positions itself. Lift your knees. That's part of the secret. And right? if, if, if you look at, and, and you mentioned about lean, and we've got so many young athletes that don't even know where the balls of their feet are. They, many times when, when some of our instructors are, 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 are trying to help base running, and obviously because we're the, the big gorilla in, in the baseball and softball world, we'll, we'll at times cross into the – the speed world and base running and base stealing and first step quickness and drop steps in the outfield. But um, th there seems to be a confusion. Are, are balls of the feet and tippy toes the same thing? No, but, you know, just to get them, balls of the feet, some, you know, some folks might be like, huh, what you talking about? So balls of the feet, it's not tippy toes. Ballerinas go tippy toes. But just imagine you're jumping rope and that's the balls of your feet. You're jumping on the balls of your feet, or, you know, you can say get on your toes, but it's really not your toes. The balls of your feet are basically like a beam, a support beam in a building that has load-bearing floors. The balls of the feet is part of the skeletal structure that goes through the foot, up to the shin, up to the femur, up to the hips, and that's where you balance it. So that's really a support beam, okay? And, um, yeah, so balls of the feet gives your skeletal structure or your structure support for force that you generate. And here's the deal. When you lift up and you run, 
let's just say you're 100 pounds, but when you come down, you are uh, five times your body weight based on momentum and gravitational pull. Heavy, heavy stuff, baby. Hmm. So you got to stay on the balls of your feet. Otherwise, you will hurt yourself. Speed must be respected. It's real force. It can tear muscle, break bone. Hey, it's, it's real. It's miles per hour. It's real force, velocity. Ed, how about, how about this for some advice that we give some of the children that we see and even some of the older ones? Hey, you're a little fat. you got to get a little lighter. How's that for unbelievable wisdom? Little Johnny who comes in maybe 15, 20 pounds over. We had a few weeks ago um, Melanie Dwornick, our health uh, nutritionist, dietitian, and you certainly see the problem that we have in the United States as it relates to teenage and even childhood obesity. Um, real simple formula and, and look no further than, than watching the physiques and, and the strength and the, and the tone of some of the best runners in the world. Our, our advice, as nutritious as it is, hey, you need to lose weight because guess what? You're not going to be able to get your knees up. You're not going to have stride length when you've got 15 pounds of a flat tire per- permitting that move from happening. Bad advice, good advice, or common sense? Well, you know, it's common sense, but therein lies, you know, shame on us adults. You know, I, I hear this. Son, you need to get faster, okay? Son, you need to work on your footwork, okay? Son, you need to lose some weight. No, you get fast. You can't be heavy running fast. Okay, great. And they leave. They turn around and walk away scratching their head. How? How? Answer the question, how? And then, you know, to be followed up with why. So no one's giving the answer. Yeah, 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 I know I'm fat. How am I going to fix it? Well, just uh, I've heard it all. You know, it's ridiculous. So the answer is providing a solution. Yeah, I know I have bad footwork, but how do I fix it? No one's doing that, you know. So I think, you know, grown-ups, parents are, 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 are guilty of not providing a solution. And then to their defense, they don't know. So it's much better to say you don't know than come up with some kind of shenanigan because you're really hurting a kid, you know. And that's kind of when, you know, my hair raises on the back of my neck because, you know, how dare you? You know, if you don't know, be honest, so then the kid can get an answer. So that's kind of what I, I'm a big advocate of kids, man. It's all about dreams, you know, and giving kids no direction and not knowing an answer, but giving them the problem, that's part of the problem. It perpetuates we're, it. So, we're, yeah, it's we're common t- sense. It's common sense. I've also heard the other side, Tony, um, in the, especially in Major League Baseball. I've heard it even in the high-level baseball. Son, you need to gain weight. Well, why? I have a guy that's throwing 96 miles an hour. He says, you need to gain 15 pounds. Why? For what? I'm already throwing 96. It's, it, there's no, you know, they can't answer the question why. There's science behind it, but it's not about size. It's about function. And the body is kind of like a thermometer. And once it's fit, it tells you what weight it needs to be. You just don't go at 15 pounds because the, the other side of that coin is, well, you know, you lost a step. And, you know, you're not performing like you used to. And guess what? You've been set up to get cut by the same people that told you to gain weight. We're talking you know? speed and sprint training with Ed Lovelace from Fusioneer. We're going to start getting into some touch and peel, scratch and flaws, and what those arms need to look like in order to get a chance to be a good frontline runner. Good afternoon, Tony Abatini. Game on. We forgot to mention and give thanks to our sponsors from ShopRite, one place to find all your good holiday foods, and certainly our friends at AAU Baseball. Uh, without their help and, and support, Game On would not be entering its, looks like almost its third month now in broadcast. We're privileged to have Ed Lovelace still with us. Ed, we're actually going to take a call. Uh, I don't know where it's coming in from, but uh, caller, do you have a question for Ed Lovelace? Yes, hi. My name's Peter, uh, high school football coach. Ed, I uh, noticed you and Tony were just speaking about some of the, the bigger players, you know, talking about gaining the weight and the effects it has on the speed. Um, as far as a football player from a high school standpoint, I got some, some big players. What are some things I can do to get them faster? Because I know moving into the next level and into the college even further, the difference between these kids is their speed. You know, more more so their size. They have to be big and fast. So I got a 300 pound lineman. What do I do to, to get him faster? <laughs> right. Um, the pleasure to meet you, coach. So the, this think of this as this. Like I'm as soon as uh, I don't know in a week or so, I'm going to be working on NFL guys getting ready for combine. Hello? Every size from. Are you there? Hello. 
Did we lose Peter? Well, he, he's probably listening, Ed. Go ahead. Okay. So I can answer him. So with that said, I've dealt with every, every ilk of football player. So the deal is this. Don't think of it as football. The higher levels, Division One and, and, and NFL, look, everybody knows how to play football. They say, we don't teach you. To, uh, uh, we don't teach you. We pay you to play. So with that, they're looking for the fastest football players. So with that said, gaining the weight, so they have to be big, of course, and muscle. They have to learn how to move that weight. Running is really weightlifting in disguise. So what you have to do is get these guys fit to be at that size. And, of course, they're lifting because they need it for the strength and the combat that's going on out in the field. So with that, you've got to take big fellas and teach them how to move like fast big fellas, all right? First of all, most big fellas run flat-footed, all right? And they say, well, I'm on the line, big deal. You know, the NFL, they're moving, and they will roll them over, especially D1 as well. So it's about getting the, keeping their size, not fat, but muscle and flexibility and movement, and then having them being able to move that 280, 300 pounds swiftly. Think of like a silverback gorilla. They have to move like that. Okay, even though they are big and heavy, they can move the weight. So the first tip on big fellas, Coach, if I were you, get them on the balls of their feet and make them move. They may not move like a DB or a wide out, but they can move. So you group them, and then you, you make them uh, dedicated to time and watch the times move. So you got them running, they don't know, 50 yards. they got to cover a body of work at 50 yards over and over again, whereby they're not dropping dead. And they move. It's very simple. So think of running as weightlifting. Get them on the balls of their feet. Watch a big fellow's cut corners and beat, beat guys on snaps. Ed, you, mentioned, Ed, you mentioned weight training. And, and I know uh, in, in talking to you and, and, and watching you in action, the interrelation between proper weight training and speed. Uh, yeah. And, again, let, let's, let, let's get away from the big uh, – high school linebacker, but now you've got a, just a good high school athlete, uh, whether it's a softball, baseball player, a- any specific advice or even general advice on what type of weight training you would recommend? I, I know we, we kind of went back and, and kept it real simple. We think that, that a, a ton of squat work, um, the good old-fashioned push-ups, and you can do push-ups in so many different positions and variations. Um, the pull-up bar, which we think is a great way to just improve overall upper body strength. What other strength workout or, or, or exercises could be done as it relates to this never-ending challenge to find more speed? Sure. Again, going back to it, running is weightlifting in disguise. You're, you get drafted with your body, okay? There's no weight room there. Your body is the weight room. So if that's the case, before you ever, you know, football, while they have to pick up the steel, for the coaches to really get a true read, not even just football, but anybody, Anyone who gets, wants to get a true read on the fitness or the strength of their athlete, if you can't lift your own body weight, why on earth are you going to go pick up more steel on top of what you can't lift? So take them to the room and find out if they can do a pull-up. Find out if they can do a push-up. You're going to find out they can't. I know big fellows can bench 350, can't do 10 pull-ups, you know, or maybe that's the max. So, you know, you know we have this thing called bar metrics, and basically it's on body weight. If you can do what I mean, and I just maintain this, I do five sets of 20 pull-ups alternating with 20 dips, all right? 20 pull-ups, 20 dips, five sets, that's 100. I can bench 350, okay? That's in a, in inner strength. And then you can start picking up the steel and doing the power cleans and squats. People stay away from the body weight because it's real work, all right? Another one is, here's, here's a good one. Throw it out there for you coaches. Simple, 10 pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 10 dips, one hour. How many sets can they get? They'll fall apart. That'll give you a strength test. Hmm. All right? So here's a number, guys. Uh, my guys that run 6'3", six, 6'2", six, all right, guys that run 10 flat, they'll do 10 pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 10 dips for one hour, 45 sets. That's how strong you got to be. So, you know, weightlifting is great and you need it because that's an that's a element of speed, but you have to be capable of lifting the weight properly, which is what running is. Okay, running is weightlifting, and every step you're in a constant state of fatigue, which means that you must be strong to deal with the fatigue factors as you go down the field or down the straightaway. That's what it is. So there's your weightlifting in a snapshot. Ed, you mentioned, uh, in fact, one of your it's one of your favorite exercises, the famous wabas. I, I, we run into yep. some of your students around the country, 
Uh, let's talk, if we can, the importance of that core as it relates to speed, and, and maybe you can educate the the audience on on what this Waba push-up is. I'm sorry, this Waba sit-up is, and 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 really segueing into a little fast twitch pattern activity, and what exactly that means, and how the Waba, in particular. Um, is truly related to what the body is doing when it's running. Sure. Okay, so what happens is everybody talks to core. Abandon that word. All right? Um, you know, coming from the elite athlete perspective, you have to set the mindset. And all due respect for those who use it, but you know what? It's not good enough because it, it is too generic. The core, uh, we say it's for couch potato. You're trying to run 6'3", you're trying to run 10 flat. I mean, 10 flat doesn't even cut it anymore. You're trying to run sub 10 seconds for 100 meters and on and on and on. Your abdominal hips and system is one system, all right? We call it a lift system. And that system is a system that lifts all body, you know, weight left, right, forward, and back, all right? The wabas, the wabas are abdominal exercise that uh, uh, it stands for who's afraid of the big bad ab. It's something that's funny, but it's very, very serious. And what happens is it basically teaches an individual how to operate on red line, which is what sprinting is, like you're sitting in your grandmother's rocking chair. No facial expression, but you're going full tilt. That is the world of sprinting. And everybody says, oh, you need to go slow to move the body, but here's the deal. You have to speed to get speed. Speed operates off of two worlds. In order to get in shape, uh, run, work on speed, you have to get in shape, which means that you have to be anaerobically sound, which means you've got to have a big oxygen gas tank. Once you have that gas tank, you operate, or, yeah, you operate anaerobically to some degree, which means you operate without oxygen. So the wobbles are designed to have your transmission, if you would, or your, your system, hips, lower, middle, and upper abdominis, to operate in an, an well, close to an anaerobic state, or ultimately when you do them enough, you're in an anaerobic state, which means you have to operate without oxygen, and that's what sprinting is. So, you know, it, it's, it's the firing of the hips and abdominals at once, which is the system that makes the bat move, which is the system that makes the torque for pitching move, pop times move, and, of course, the 60. And that is also the same system that world-class sprinters use when they start and they go down the field or down the track for 100 meters, it comes from there. And if you don't have it, you won't go fast. You might luck up, but it's inconsistent. So the wobbles are designed basically, here's a number. Wobbles, one set is 1,000, and everything's based off the world record. So wobble, one set of wobbles is 1,000. The world record for wobbles is 3 minutes and 30 seconds for John Bivitt. John Bivitt's Milwaukee Brewers. So that's the level that you have to be at in order to even start contemplating of talking high-level baseball and sprinting. Okay, those of you, those of you that are seconds. listening, that are saying, "What the heck is this Waba?" You'll have to either visit your nearest frozen ropes, um, or find and, and locate where where Ed Lovelace will be. Um, very difficult to describe. It's a it's a sit up in in a leg up position. It's done at a very fast rate. It's hard to do. Ed mentioned a thousand wabas. It's probably the first time you, you'll be doing it. Even if you think that you're a pretty good high school athlete, you probably you hit the. You'll, you'll probably fatigue out at the 50 to 75 mark. Uh, but it, it, it's a remarkable, and it, it's really just one piece of the strength training that is so critical that that Ed has presented to so many coaches and amateur players across the country. Ed, moving gears, or we're going to go up a little bit, up the ladder a little bit on these runners. The arm action. Um, even the even the the so-called speed coaches, the phys ed teachers that are that are learning what to do, um, it it doesn't take an expert, and and this is certainly no knock on you or or the other ones who who have done it at that level. Um, you can certainly help some of the young runners that we see in their direction, because if they have better direction, if they're north and south, as we call it, they're going to get to that finish line a little bit faster by just simply getting them to understand the power of 90 degrees in the arms. I'd like you to elaborate on the magic of 90, as I call it. Sure. All right. So first, the reason why I'm capable of teaching this is running where is a fixed position. Whereas baseball, you deal with variables, arm positions, slots, stances, on and on and on and on and on. The beauty of running, it's one position all based on a circle, which brings us back to physics, which brings us back to numbers, which you cannot argue. All right? So the world of 
90, let's get into why 90, because arms need to be positioned in a 90 degree uh, uh, position, all right, which is a quarter of a circle. If you extend that arm down, now you have 180 degrees. I just proved to the world that when you run, the arms are in a circular position. 180 degrees, that's half of a circle. You've got a circle working up top. When you run, the knees must be up, which means the knee and the lower leg, uh, the shin, makes a 90-degree angle. You open that up, that's 180 degrees that are kind of juxtaposed, right, against one another, addressing the first law of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So you're dealing with circular movement, which is the only perfect thing in the world. Circle is perfect. So the goal for the sprinter or the runner that runs the 60 or the 40, you want to stay in position and maintain that position, or as we call it work in the circle. You work the circle for as long as you can, which means you're really maintaining form and will sustain whatever you've generated to run through the finish line, whatever that may be. So that's why 90 degrees is key, because you're in circular motion. The minute you break form, you go from a circle to an oval, which is like a warped tire. It will roll, but it is inefficient, which means it will cost you time. The fastest guy is the guy who holds form the longest, period. Ed, running uphill, I know that's a question that high school coaches and travel coaches ask us all the time. Um, good, bad, and different, one piece of the pie. Um, you know, you, you read the literature that's out there in, in the age of the Internet. Is, as, as you know, everybody can profess to be an expert in speed and agility uh, by reading uh, articles from, I call them the no-names, the, the people that have a little bit of information but uh, have, have not either studied it or brought in people like yourself to, to teach it. Um, is it a magic bullet running uphill or running downhill, or is that another one of the, uh, I call it the toys of the ladders and the cones that you see in so many of these speed and agility programs? Yeah, you know what it is, it's just, Again, sensory overload. Indifferent. Have I run uphill and run downhill? Absolutely. Um, But let's get right to it. You don't get drafted running downhill nor uphill. Baseball, football, basketball. There's no hill in a major league baseball park, period. Nor are there ladders nor cones, except for where you begin and where you finish. And sometimes it's not even there. You just got it marked off. So with that, what happens is you're reinforcing bad habits. Because, yeah, while they're getting their knees up, the leg is kicking back, so you have a back kick, and that's, 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 that's further reinforcement of bad habits. Before you start running fast, you've got to learn how to run slow first. Speed is the ultimate oxymoron. Ultimate oxymoron. You've got to learn how to run slow first in order to go fast. It's just like a race car driver. Well, Ed, explain you that, though. Drive, Ed, huh? Ed, explain how you need to learn how to run slow before you run fast. Right. The deal is this. There's no difference between, let's just put it like this, 100 miles an hour is 100 miles an hour, whether you threw it or whether you're driving it, okay? Speed doesn't care who it is that got you there. Black, white, Puerto Rican, Spanish, Chinese, girl, boy, does not care. Speed goes, hey, if you got me up here, it's your responsibility to deal with the ramifications of getting me here. So if you can get, I've run about 26 miles an hour in my lifetime. That's real speed. We know what happens in an accident at 26 miles an hour, okay? So with that, the same position that you're in when you run slow is the same position you must be in when you're running fast. <laughs> if you do not, the, 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 the structure is going to be compromised and the speed doesn't care, and you'll get hurt. So you have to learn how to run slow over and over and over again at a fraction of 100% or a percentage of 100%. So that when you go hit it one time, you can do so at 100% and maintain it. Most guys want to run fast and can't handle the ramifications of speed nor the fitness requirements that you must have in order to deal with it going forward. Speed is ruthless, and it will let you know you're not ready, and it will punish you because fitness must be in place, which is anaerobic fitness and the maintenance of that form that you should have learned when you were doing it slow. Most don't. There you go. Ed, interesting, and it segues back to you need to learn how to walk first. Uh, I know, and, and again, this is coming right from the the uh, Speed Bible, according to Ed Lovelace. The, the way in which you jog is the way in which you run, and, and I, I think the, the biggest gain that, that we've seen 
in the athletes that have come up to our, our location in Chester, New York, and, and I know some of our locations are either have had you or planning to have you out there. How you jog is going to eventually be how you run. And, and we've also started realizing that uh, simply jogging is not sometimes the best way to teach stride length, stride frequency, knees up, balls of the feet. You can get into some really bad habits as, as a runner by, by over, uh, I call it the over allowance of, of jogging. Yes, you can work on, on posture. You can certainly work on your arm mechanics. But if the formula that you shared with us earlier in the show, stride length times stride frequency equals speed, well, the, the typical jog doesn't really max out stride length, and you're certainly not in any hurry to hit that frequency rate. Right. Well, here's what's going on. Let's get this simple. Walk is the little brother. Jog is the, the, the medium brother. And sprinting or full-out running is the big brother. So you got little brother, medium brother, big brother. Simple. And jogging, let's look at jogging and running because of the heel strike involved, heel touch involved in walking. When you jog and you run, it's just one's a little more intense than the other, which brings us back to what I said. The beauty of it is is nothing new, and it keeps going back to the same laws. Running is weightlifting in disguise. Many, you know, like you said, yeah, they're jogging, but they're really not getting after it or getting after it properly when you get them into the run because of one thing only. They don't have the hip strength in order to lift the knee to bring the leg up to the 90-degree position or close to 90 degree so that they cover ground, which is a stride length, which brings me back to running is weightlifting in disguise. Don't think of the leg as a leg anymore. Think of the leg as a big, heavy lever. That hip flexor, that muscle that lifts the leg is the bicep for the leg. If it's weak, it's not going to be able to lift that weight over and over and over again. Maybe your first step, but not the last step, which is where you win the gold medal, where you run the fast time. So everybody listening to this radio, anybody talking about the first step, stop. It's all about the last step, and you work backwards. You don't run fast off the first step. You can get a great start and get run down. <laughs> so and time will run away from you. So lift your knees, man. And the jog is just the watered-down version of the run. When you start running, you're picking that leg up. That's that. Simple. Ed, as we listen to your, to your theory, um, and, and a lot of this certainly in the track world is, is all about linear speed, right? The 100 to 200 meter is all about running straight. Uh, th- there's some of your principles apply, and I, I believe that they do, but I, I wanted you to, in the few minutes that we have left, talk about redirection, acceleration, first step quickness. I, I, is that a different school of thought? I, is that not uh, Ed Lovelace's and the Fusioneering's world? Um, because at, at times you'll have college coaches and, and even high school coaches, hey, this stuff that, that Turn and Burn is all about, which is a baby product of, of Ed Lovelace, this is all about linear speed. It's not real, right? It's about cutting. It's about redirection, changing speed. How would you address the skeptics? No such thing as a clumsy cheetah. <laughs> a cheetah can run and catch the gazelle. The gazelle cuts right, the cheetah cuts. The gazelle goes straight, the cheetah goes and gets him. He cuts left, he cuts left. Agility, redirection, cutting is all a byproduct of speed. If you are a home run hitter, you should know how to bunt. Okay? Right. So with that, you work on the big thing. It's no problem to then, you'll have the hip strength to run fast, which means that the footwork will be in place because the hips are strong. Footwork is the caboose. The hips and the abdominals and all that kind of stuff is the engine. Work on that, and then when you're running a route five and in, a V, a curl, you're going to be able to stop on a dime because the strength is there to redirect, cut. So, yeah, it is about that because the skill of position applies, but at the end of the day, that is a derivative of speed, period. So it's it's not okay. one or the other. As, as you continue to improve your speed and, and, and strength, the the byproduct, the, the the game efficiency and redirection and first step quickness, that'll that'll flow from that. That that's good to know. And and I'm sure some of the coaches out there that are sometimes concerned, well, my my my, my players are getting faster, but are they able to make these moves? Um, your point is well taken, Ed. Get them faster. Get them stronger in the areas that you just mentioned, and the the other variables will, will take care of itself. 
Um, w w the little time that we have left, Ed, jump and rope. Uh, we we've heard people say, hey, that's the magic bullet. You know, jump and rope all the time is even better than going out there and just simply running. Um, we've looked at that and said, well, wait a minute. Um, there, there are some good things that jump roping is doing. Balls of the feet, we get it. It's an anaerobic move to an extent. You're building up aerobic endurance, but uh, we don't see a lot of knee height on that. Um, in the one minute that we have left, jump rope, is it part of it, uh, of the overall scheme of things? Is it another toy, or do we discard it? It's, 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 it's armor roll, okay? Armor roll doesn't make the Formula One race car go. It just makes the tires look shiny. It's the function and the movements that make you go forward, but at the end of the day, you're going up and down. Yeah, it, 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 it reinforces the action and will actually strengthen the, hip, the heel, I mean the ankle lock and the foot placement, but you're going to have to take that action and go forward, and therein lies the piece. If you're just jumping rope, what it's really saying is, I really don't want to go yep. forward. I just want to look good standing still. Ed, Ed we're running out of time as we hear Chris Brown's song in the background. On behalf of everyone at Game On, we want to wish Mr. Ed Lovelace a, a happy holiday. we got to get you back up in New York, in, in Orange County, and back on the show soon. For all of our listeners, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and continue to run fast and go out and play.